good morning. Well, I suppose for you it could be afternoon or evening, but welcome either way. This is the sixth message of the 10 week series. Um, last week, or I suppose not last week, last message, we talked about truth as opposed to false teaching and, and how we want to protect against false teaching and we want to uh, we want to have truth. We want to embrace truth, and that that truth is embodying it, embodied in the person of Christ. And over the next few few sermons, we're going to be three sermons. We're going to be dealing with Ephesians chapter one, and I mentioned that this is probably one of the passages that many people like to, especially if you're in the Nazarene or Wesleyan Church. This is the chapter that you tend to avoid. Um, because it is talking quite a bit about predestination and this plan that God has um, that uh, he always works out all things in conformity with his will. And I just decided a while ago, going through this passage, I, I figured I would dive right in. So let's let's dive in. with. I want to dive in with you. Um, you should have a paper that you can use as discussion points. And hopefully you're watching this with other people if you can, and then you can discuss it later, or you can wrestle with it yourself, and you can call me if you'd like, or or better yet, um, you know, if you really if it really sparks some interest, you can uh, you can make your pastor talk about it. <laughs> um, but really looking forward to this. Um, now Ephesians chapter one is is a little different. It's interesting the way that Paul writes this because. Typically, there, there are really two phrases that Paul uses most commonly throughout the scriptures. And uh, the first phrase is that he says, Christ lives in you. And the other phrase is that you live in Christ. And there, those are the two things he says most often throughout his books. And I think I typically preach regarding Jesus living in you more than the other way around. Um but I think for the most part, we understand what we mean by that. Um, Jesus living in you, of course, simply is referring to what we give him access to. So if Jesus lives in me, then I give him access to my thoughts. I give him access to my heart. Uh, I give him access to the, so the way that I think, the way that I process things. Um, I give him access to change my thinking, to change my mind. Giving him access to my heart, simply the idea of the heart is being the center of your, your body. It you know, pumps blood from your heart to the extremities and back, and it comes back to your heart. So the Jews believed it was the center of your, of your life. It was the thing that kept you alive. Um, and so the idea that Jesus comes and lives in your heart means that he takes control of your life. I remember when I asked Jesus into my life, the speaker said, you can come forward and ask Jesus into your heart. And we do believe that. We believe that Jesus comes and lives in us. It, it, it Maybe in more of an abstract sense, it means that he lives in 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 my feet. Uh, I mean, in a literal sense, he lives in my feet. But in an abstract sense, it means that he directs me. He directs my path. He directs my future. Uh, he helps me go the right way rather than the wrong way. He leads me. He guides me. Jesus, for, for instance, was, was led by the Spirit. Um, chapter 4 of Matthew, everything that Jesus did, really, in fact, I think he was led by the Spirit. God, God lived in him. Uh, Colossians chapter uh, two, 2, verse 9, says that, For in Christ the fullness of the deity dwelt. So God lived in Jesus. And then in verse 10 of chapter Colossians 2, 10, says that you have been given fullness in Christ. So as God lived in Christ, Christ lives in you, which is the fullness of God. So he lives in you. It means he lives in my hand. It means that he directs my hand. He tells my hand what to do, what not to do. He, he, protects, he protects my hand from evil, and he guides my hand to do what is right. Um, the analogy I've used is that if, if you have temptation in your life, two inches from your fingertips, you don't have time to go find God outside that you need God in your hand. You need God in your fingertips. If you have temptation to interest from your fingertips, you need God in your fingertips. So that when the enemy is tempting you, God lives in you and is directing you. So that's this whole concept of Christ living in you. You give him access to your life. 
But let's take that for a moment and we're going to reverse it. And the other common phrase that Paul uses, instead of saying that Christ is in you, the phrase is, you are in Christ, which I think has the opposite connotations to it. Uh, so if Christ lives in you, you're giving Christ access to your life. But if you live in Christ, then it's those things that you have access to as a son and daughter of Christ. You have access to those things in Christ, which is really a pretty awesome concept. So you say, well, what kind of things do we have access to? Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. So all throughout chapter 1, he's going to tell you all of those things that you have access to in Christ, that you have access to every spiritual blessing. Now, that means that he's not saying some spiritual blessings. He's saying every spiritual blessing you have access to. The analogy that I have is, you know, when I was, I think, nine years old, I got to fly on an airplane for the first time. And beforehand, there's a lot of, before flying on an airplane, uh, you have the opportunity to do a lot of things uh, regarding an airplane. So, for example, you can you can gain a lot of knowledge about an airplane before you've been on an airplane. You can gain knowledge of an airplane. You can know what kind of airplanes, what different airplanes are. You can learn about the first airplane. You can learn about um, the different types of airplanes and how some airplanes have passengers. Some airplanes, you can only fit one person. You can have jet airplanes. You can have... Uh, propeller airplanes with propellers you can have you can have all kinds of different you can have all kinds of different knowledge knowledge of them you can look at the military airplanes that were used in world war one world war ii uh, you can even go to an airplane museum and you can look at all kinds of different airplanes and how they were invented the different different things that each airplane has you can know what kind of engine it has how fast it goes how slow how slow it can go before it goes you know, falls to the ground. Um, you all of you all of those things. You can understand the physics of an airplane. What keeps an airplane up instead of coming down? In fact, if you wanted to, you could go up to an airplane and you could give it one big hug. But there's a big difference between knowing information about an airplane and actually getting in the airplane. Same thing. You can know all the information about Christ. You can know all the right things. You can know all the doctrine, all the theology, all the right things. You can know what to do when you go to church. You can know when to stand up, when to sit down. You can know all of those things, but it's a whole different deal when you finally choose to be in Christ, to get in, in the airplane. And you see, when you get in the airplane, you finally have access to those things in the airplane. You know, my... I'm just that guy. I travel a lot, and I remember getting uh, on an airplane. I had a connecting flight, and the first flight was late by about a half an hour. So I had about 10 minutes to get from my first flight to my second flight. And this happened right about lunchtime. So I had initially planned to get lunch at the airport, but I didn't have time. I had to run to my next flight. I got there just in time, but I was really, really hungry. Uh, so during the flight, the uh, attendant, flight attendant came by and offered me, you know how they give like the peanuts or the, um, you know, the crackers or whatever they might give and then a pop. I was so hungry. I just decided I'm going to be that guy. And I asked for like a dozen things of like <laughs> peanuts and, and crackers and stuff. And then a couple pops. Uh, but the, 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 the reality was I had access to those things in the airplane. I got to enjoy those things in the airplane. I got to experience what it was to actually take flight. Now, I could have known all the physics on how it could have worked, but once I got in the airplane, I actually experienced what it was like to take flight and all of the things that I, you can have access to when you, when you participate in that. In the same sense, it's not until you get in Christ that you really experience what it's like to be in Christ, to, to experience what it is to walk with him, to experience the, the joys of, of living in him and all of those spiritual blessings that he gives you access to. And so that's, that's what I want to talk about. What are those things that you have access to? Also, uh, chapter 2, he's going to say this, this spiritual blessings in Christ thing. He's going to say it 
but really in a pretty awesome way in chapter two. Not that he hasn't already said awesomely. Um, chapter two, verse four, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in our transgressions, for it is, or it, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that the, in the coming ages he might show us the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So notice verse 7. He says, In order that in the coming ages we might know the incomparable riches of his grace in Christ Jesus. So what's one of the things we get to know in Christ Jesus? We get to know the incomparable riches of his grace. Uh, as a preacher, that word incomparable is a very frustrating word. Because most of what I do when I preach I is comparing things so that we can understand. Jesus does it quite a bit, actually. In fact, he, he takes physical things like streams of living water, like rivers of water, and he takes physical things and he ex uses those to explain spiritual realities. So the spiritual reality was to understand that the Holy Spirit lives in you like rivers of water or streams of water. So he takes a physical thing in order to describe a spiritual reality. He does that all the time throughout scriptures. And that's why, and I do that when I preach all the time, I'm using physical examples like the airplane was a physical ex example to explain a spiritual reality. Um, but when I come to verse 7, he says, that the riches of his grace is incomparable. In other words, you can't compare the riches of God's grace at all. It's incomparable. In fact, the word itself is the word, it's a compound Greek word, the word hyper and the word ballo. So the word hyper means far, and the word ballo means to throw. So the word itself means to throw far. We can translate it um, to exaggerate or far beyond. Uh, it, it, it can be translated incomparable. Uh, in fact, the, the, the literal way to talk about it would be to imagine a target out in the distance. And just because I like archery, uh, imagine taking a, a, a bow and arrow and shooting the arrow out toward the target. And as you shoot the arrow toward the target, you miss by a long shot, literally. And the arrow goes far beyond the target. That's this word. In other words, think for a moment about God's riches, the riches of his grace. Try to imagine it. Try to, the wildest imagination you can possibly have, just as far as you can think. And as much as you can think, as good or as, as, as big as you can think about God's riches of his grace, whatever that is, his grace is incomparable to that. It goes far beyond that. It shoots much farther than that. That's, that's the idea of this word. In fact, it's used a couple other times. It's used to describe God's power. And it says that God's power, and that's in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19, that God's power is incomparable. It's, it's hyperbalo. In other words, you're a pipsqueak in comparison to God. Uh, God has so much more power than you or anything else in all creation that you can't even fathom or compare God's power with whatever else is in the world. God's power is incomparable. It's the same idea of uh, when the na when nations, they begin to rebel against God, they decide to come together and try to build this large tower, the Tower of Babel, as high as they can, they can, uh, uh, they can build it. And the scripture uses sarcasm to explain this, that it's the best that humanity can do, a tower reaching all the way to the skies, the best that they can do was so puny. It, the scripture says that God had to look down and find them 
because of how little and tiny they were, how insignificant, the best that humanity had to offer, how insignificant it was. It's the idea of incomparable. God's riches, his grace is incomparable. The spiritual blessings that God gives you, every spiritual blessing you have in Christ Jesus is so incredible that you can't compare it with anything else. It goes far beyond anything you can imagine. I probably don't have to say this, but obviously we're not talking about physical riches. We're talking about spiritual riches in Christ. The thing about physical riches is that you have to work your whole life. You can, you can grind it out your entire life, building and accumulating physical riches. But by the time you get to the end of your life, all that work, all of those physical riches that you, all of that effort you put into physical riches, eventually it's going to all disappear. But the beauty of these spiritual blessings that you have in Christ is that you don't do a single thing in order to accept these riches, or you have to accept them, but you don't do anything to earn these riches. In fact, he tells you in verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it is a gift of God. Not by work so that anyone can boast, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us in advance to do. In other words, what he's saying is, there's, there, you can't, it's not by works, this, these spiritual riches, you don't, you, don't, you don't get these by anything you've done, not by anything you've accomplished. The only way to receive these is to accept the free gift that God gives you in his son, Jesus Christ. And that by opening that gift, by believing in Christ, by living in Christ, by jumping all in, not by staying on the outside and knowing all the knowledge and the information, but if you jump all in and experience Jesus, you have these blessings. And those blessings go for all eternity, as opposed to the physical blessings, which at the end of the day are meant for nothing. So... Now, for this message in the next few, I want to look at these spiritual blessings. And I want to look at a small one now since we've spent 17 minutes talking about it. But the first spiritual blessing that he gives us in, in verse 5 of chapter 1, and actually, let me just start with verse 4 since I haven't read that yet. He says, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight, in love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So the first spiritual blessing that he gives you is adoption into sonship. Now, just like the example of the plane, adoption into sonship is, is, is the same concept. Uh, you see, you can be on the outside of a family. You can be a, a friend of the family. But if you're a friend of the family... You don't have full access to what a family has. Uh, if you're a friend of the family, no matter how close you are, no matter how often you come over to visit, at the end of the day, you're not a part of the family. But when you're adopted into a family, you have total, complete access as, as full sons and daughters of Christ. And what God says is one of the spiritual blessings he gives you is that he gives you absolute access to God. And I'm telling you, that blows my mind. To have access as adopted sons and daughters of Christ means to have complete and total access to God himself. That's unbelievable. Now notice, because I'm not going to skip over it, he says in verse 4, that he chose us in him before the creation of the world. And in verse 5, in order to become a part of the, be adopted into, into sonship, he says he predestined us for adoption into sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Now we have to deal with that. Uh, this, Like I said, this is one of the passages that if you're a Calvinist, you love. If you're an Arminian, you usually skip. I don't want to do that. Because I believe, as an Arminian, we be, I believe in predestination. 
See, there's no way you can come to the scripture and not believe in predestination. It's not like Arminians come over here and we read predestination and we're just like, you know what, let's just ignore it. Or tell you what, better yet, let's just strike that out of our Bible. We don't do that. You see, it's not whether or not we believe in predestination. It's what we believe in regards to predestination. That's really important. So we believe different things about predestination, but it's what we believe. So I believe in predestination with my whole heart because it's in the scriptures, but what do I believe about it? Um, so, so predestination. The difference is a Calvinist would believe in, in, a, in what they would call an individual predestination. In other words, God predestines some people to go to heaven, which logically then means that if he predestines some to go to heaven, that means that he predestines some to go to hell. So that would be pre individual predestination. But what I believe, or the Nazarene Wesleyan Church would believe, we believe in a group predestination. Which means that God, and see, in our society in America, we're so individual-minded, we often think of salvation as an individual thing, but really salvation is more of a it's, a, it's a group thing, it's a church thing. Yes, you as an individual can be saved, but you're saved because you're a part of the, the body of Christ. Not just talking about a physical building church, but you're part of the church universal, that you're part of something bigger than yourself. And so I believe in a group predestination, which means that the church, see, Paul is talking to the church. He's not just talking to individuals. He's talking to the church, and he's saying that you, as a church, were predestined. Now, if you, as an individual, if, you, if you're in the church, if you're in the group, then you're predestined. If you're outside of the group, you're not predestined. Think with me for a moment. Think back into the Old Testament. The Old Testament was this way. When God came to save, uh, to save, he came to save the group. He came to save the Israelites. And the Israelites throughout history, the, um, throughout history, uh, if you were in the group, you were saved. If you were outside of the group, you weren't. But remember that there were people inside of this group that were already part of the group that when they sinned or, or, or they lived in open rebellion, they were cut off from the group. So I absolutely I believe that you can you can the group is predestined you can be in the group and be predestined with the group but you can also be cut off just like people were cut off in Israel. But in the same sense, the Israel the purpose of Israel was not just to save um, wasn't just to save themselves. God used their used the Israelites to save all the nations. So there were actually people that were not Jews that were grafted into this salvation to Israel. So there were people grafted in, which which tells you that if you're you're I believe in predestination. If you're a part of the group, you're you're predestined. If you're outside of the group, you're not. Um, let's see how far to go with this. Uh, one of the most commonly d disputed passages is the passage on uh, for predestination is the passage in in Exodus where it says that Pharaoh hardened his heart and. A lot of Calvinists will use that as to say, okay, well, God hardened his heart. God God prevented him from, from being saved. He had no chance. But what many may not realize is that in, in Exodus chapter 8, verse, I think it's 32 or 23, where it says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Now, the question is, which one is it? Did, did Pharaoh harden his own heart or did God harden Pharaoh's heart? Which one was it? Now, my answer to you would be to say it's both. But how can that be? How can God harden someone's heart, Pharaoh's heart, and at the same time, how can Pharaoh harden his own heart? Um, the analogy that's helped me the most is to, think of, uh, is to think of two different elements. Think of clay, for example, and then think of butter. If you take clay and butter and you put them out in the sun and the, the sun shines down on them, the heat of the sun or the rays, when it shines on clay, it's going to harden clay because that's the posture or condition of clay. But when the sun shines on butter, it melts butter. So which one was it? Did the sun harden the clay or did the clay harden itself because it's clay? Well, yes, both. But if the sun shines on butter, then butter softens because that's the posture or position of, of, of butter. 
So I think the issue is, or the question is, what was what was the condition of, of Pharaoh's heart? See, I think that, that Pharaoh, the posture of his heart was more like clay, so that when God shined on his heart, it hardened his heart. But because Pharaoh positioned his heart to be more like clay, his heart hardened. So maybe that's convoluted for you. I hope that helps. But I think that at least answers, because we have to answer it. We don't just say, oh, let's just forget that God hardened Pharaoh's heart and just say that Pharaoh hardened his own heart, or vice versa. You can't do that. You've got to deal with both. So that's this idea of predestination. But I'm afraid that because we argue so much about this, that especially as Arminians, we tend to try to ignore this issue. But because we've ignored it so often, I think we've really missed the beauty of, of what predestination is, which is God chose you. God chose you to be a part of this group before the creation of the world. He loved you. It says in love, he predestined you. And we miss the heart or the beauty of this, this idea. So because he chose you, the application then is to say one of two things. First of all, the question I have for you is, how is your heart positioned? Is your heart positioned more like clay, where you're closed off to God and, and you're not open to what he has to say? Or is your heart more like butter, where you've opened your heart and you said, God, speak to me, whatever you want to do in my life, however you want to melt me, whatever you want to do in my life, I'm open to you. Are you more like clay or are you more like butter? And then application number two is, would you jump all in? Would you get in the plane? Would you be willing to, maybe you say, well, I, I'm, in order to have Jesus, you say, I want Jesus to have access to my life. That means you, you can be in Christ. If you give Jesus access to your heart, to your whole life, then you are also in Christ. And when you are in Christ, you have full access to God as sons and daughters, as adopted sons and daughters of Christ. So with that, again, I'll have some discussion questions. And I realize that these conversations are often pretty um, argued in the church. But regardless, can we not miss the beauty of this concept that I think Calvinists get more than we do, and, but we also need to understand God chose you. In love, he predestined you. And, and before you even did your worst, before creation of the world, before you did your worst, before you sinned, before you, before you fell short, before any of that, God said, I love you, I chose you, I'm coming after you. Because he wants you to experience every spiritual blessing in Christ, the full riches of his grace that he's offered to you as a gift. So with that, God bless, and we'll see you at the next message.